I can't see you. Me when I bring you up on the train. Oh, okay, 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 Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, 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 welcome. It is a special day. It's Tuesday, but today is the day that we celebrate Joseph, our friend. And we miss him, but we just wanted, to, we couldn't let this day go by without celebrating him. And tonight I have with me on the show none other than Uncle Fred. This is Joseph's uncle, but more like his father because he raised him. And I'm going to bring him up. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. How you doing, Uncle Fred? Uh, it, it's hard, but I'm still holding out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I stopped drinking, but maybe I need one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we just, we could, you know, we couldn't let this day go by. And I'm glad. Or Roxanne and I talked earlier, and uh, you know, you were you were Joseph's uncle. You still are his uncle, but you're our uncle too. And there's no way we could just let this day go by without celebrating your nephew's memory with you. And I, I am so grateful. I yeah. am so grateful. And I just want to let you know, and everybody in the comments is going to tell you the same thing. We love Joseph. We miss him, and but we we thank God we still got you with us. And uh, we just want to, for your family that's watching, we want to let them know that we love them and we're praying for them too, because Joseph was truly loved by a lot of people. I can't yeah. think of anybody that had anything bad to say about him. Everybody loved him. Uh, so we we just want we just want to love on tonight. And I, I'm just I'm not gonna try to take over anything tonight. I just want you to tell us about the Joseph we didn't know. Uh, from, from his early childhood up until I got the pleasure of knowing him the last couple of years. We just want to know about Joseph. So whatever you feel is on your heart, you want to talk about, go right ahead. Well, one of the biggest things I would tell you that nobody probably knows or would believe is that truthfully, Joe was very shy. I can see that. He, he was a very shy person. And most of the time he might keep to himself, but once he had friends, Mm -hmm. Joseph would friend you until you crossed him. As long as you didn't cross him, he would be your friend to the end. Right. But let's go back to uh, when he was born. Mm -hmm. When he was born, I remember his mother going to the hospital to have him. Mm -hmm. And we came later and we saw this little bundle. He was our, I want to say the, I want to say third. He was our third, what do you call it, our third um, nephew. No, he was our second nephew mm -hmm. because my oldest brother had a daughter, Jermaine, mm -hmm. and then she had a son, Jasper Jr., and then Joseph mm -hmm. was born. So he was our third nephew. But for some reason, Joe clung to me. Mm -hmm. from, from the time he was a child, he clung to me. So I did my best to take care of him and raise him and make sure nothing happened to him mm -hmm. and told him that he could be whatever he wanted to be, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And whatever you wanted to be, I would love you no matter what, mm -hmm. you know? And, and that's what young people need to know now. I think they need to know that nowadays is that you love them in spite of mm -hmm. whatever they, they do, whatever they do in life. If they get in trouble if they go to jail, no matter what, you still got to love them. Right. Because right. that's the only thing that's going to change them because love covers a multitude of sin. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. And the only way you draw people to yourself and you get them to change is through love. Mm -hmm. But anyway, to make a long story short, uh, yeah, it, it's I've been trying to think, you know, when you overthink yourself or what you want to say and mm -hmm. the memories you want to have, the memories you do have. And uh, some of those memories are when he and his sister were old enough to come stay with me. Mm -hmm. I remember one day I went in my room and they're on the floor going through all my dresser drawers. I have no clue what they were looking for. I asked them, what are y'all looking for? Oh, we're just looking. Mm -hmm. So it's like little things like that you remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I asked me some questions, Daryl, because uh, I'm like. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh, when, when you came back from, from Vietnam, uh, how long after you came back was Joseph born? Joseph was born in 71. Okay. So I was in Vietnam in 68. I came home in 68, October 68. Mm -hmm. Joe was born in 71. Okay, so you you were fairly fairly recent out of the service. You hadn't been out of the service that long when he was born. That is correct. You're right. Yeah. So so uh is Joseph the oldest of his siblings, or was he like in the middle, the youngest? No, know. they were only two, Joseph and Tracy, and he was the oldest. Okay. okay. And I think that if I remember correctly, they're three years apart. Okay, okay. So she, she was back there a few years. So you spent the first couple of years with just you and him. Right. Yeah. Right. And and that was right and let, me, let me let me just divert one minute because I want to tell you the story about um go ahead, go ahead. Tracy. Mm -hmm. When Tracy was born, I think they were at my mother's house. Mm -hmm. And what happened was I was there and my sister's water broke and all of that. And she said, oh, I'm getting ready to have this baby. So there was no time to call the ambulance or whatnot. I said, come on, let's get in my car. I'm going to take you to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so we got in my car and I'm, I'm racing to get her to the hospital. And I finally saw a cop and I stopped him. I said, my sister is getting ready to have a baby. I need an escort escort to the hospital so he said put on your blanket stay behind me and let's keep going no matter what and i did it tracy don't like me to tell that story but that that's a true story you got it there or was she born i got it in time yes i did hey, hey. that's that's a good story i mean you were there from the beginning with with both of them so yes yes and i know that You've always said, you know, I because you even talk about it now about, you know, we'd be doing certain things like, well, if Joseph was still here, Joseph would do would have done this for me or taken care of this, you know, technical stuff. And we laugh. But then I thought about it uh, when my parents were still alive and they had some question about something technical. They wouldn't. My brother was right there in the house. They would never ask him anything. They would never ask my sister. They would call me. Well, Daryl, I, I, uh, oh, how do I do that? And I have to try to explain it on the phone. I said, Gene, this, this, I said, give Gene the phone. I'll tell Gene what to do, and then he'll show you. And they didn't, they didn't like that. They wanted me to tell them directly. Well, I need to learn how to do. I said, Well, he's gonna show you, but they wasn't hearing it. So right. I understood how you like. He, he was, he was like a, a big help to you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that was one of the main things. When, when Roxanne came to me about doing it, I said, oh, no question. She said, are you available? I said, yeah, this is Uncle Fred. I said, you know, of course, I I'm I'm available. I'd have made time because you've done so much for us, Uncle Fred. I, I can only speak for me, but I I I'm sure everybody else in the chat will say the same thing. When we wanted to talk about something, you listen. So like I, I said it earlier, and I'm going to say it again. You're not just Joseph and Terry's uncle. You're our uncle, too. So I can't. Y'all, I can't tell you how many times, one, two o'clock in the morning, sometimes three, four in the morning, Uncle Fred up eating a Klondike bar, we laughing, <laughs> and uh, and he'll just talk to me about anything. And and I, I tell you this, um, and sometimes you'll say, well, I don't mean to bore you with my Vietnam stories, but you don't know how much listening to those stories helped me because I would talk to my father when he felt comfortable talking about it. Right. But, um talking to you about that it, it, it makes me think about the good thing conversation that me and my dad had before he passed away and so i don't mind those conversations i don't mind them at all because a lot of people will never know what that time in and life was like especially for black people right 
you know, you're going over to a foreign country, you're fighting a war in another country and for helping people get their freedom and you still struggling to get freedom here in the States. Right. That's you're over there. So, uh, yeah. So when you tell me those stories, I just sit there and listen because it's like, it's like living history. It's not like picking up a book. It's like you were there. I was born while it was going on. Right. And Joseph was born towards the tail end of it. And then his sister came after it was, quote, it was over. over. Yeah. So I was I was born in the middle of it. So I don't really have any recollection of it, but I just know well, where's daddy? Where's daddy? Why isn't daddy here with us? You know, and my mom said I was always asking the question, where's daddy? Where's daddy? Oh, daddy's over here. She pulled out a, a, a globe because people still had those big globes. She said, Right, right. You're right here. Your daddy's over here. Well, why can't he come home? And I, you know, because I'm two or three, I'm asking all these questions. And mind you, uh, while all that's going on, she got me as a small baby and two older siblings, and neither one of them was teenagers yet. Well, yeah, they were. And then she only learned how to drive because she got pregnant with me. And, uh, and you're on a base down in the south. And your husband on the other side of the world, and you don't know whether he's coming home or not. Right. So that's a lot, you know. So when you tell me those stories, it, it, it brings me back into remembering all the stuff that my parents would tell me. So I don't mind those stories. And so and I'm pretty sure you shared those stories with Joseph and his sister and all your other nieces and nephews. So don't ever feel that you're boring anybody when you tell those stories because that's a part of not only world history, that's your family's history. And you sharing that because there's going to come a time when me and you are not going to be here and the, the younger ones behind us will be like, well, when I was little, uh, Uncle Daryl told me this or Uncle Freddie told me this. And that's how they keep your memory alive and me alive. Well, one of the one of the most freshest memories I have is that my niece, Tracy, her daughter, my mm -hmm. great niece, she was while she was in school she had to do some type of project on Vietnam. Mm -hmm. They knew I was in Vietnam mm -hmm. and my sister brought it to the house so I could explain some of the things that went on in Vietnam. And right. from what I understand, I think she got a good mark on her paper yeah, because right. I was giving it to her firsthand knowledge. Right. One book knowledge, like you said, it was firsthand knowledge. Right. I right. was there and I was a medical corpsman. Mm. You was all the way up on the front. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of stress. But I remember when my dad would come home from the field and doing other stuff, and he would just lay his equipment down by the door, and he'd sit there, he'd look out of the corner of his eye, because he knew I was, I was always into something. So when I figured he wasn't looking, I put on his his helmet and mm -hmm. all his little gear, and I'm stumbling through the house, and he would just laugh and laugh and laugh, and I put on his boots, and I'm stumbling, because his feet were, well, then his feet were big compared to my feet. But as I got older, my feet were bigger than his. So wow. My dad wore nine and a half, and shoot, by the time I was seventh grade, I was wearing a thirteen. So, Ooh. yeah, I, was, I the, the size I am now, I was fifteen pounds heavier, and, but three inches shorter. But this is the size I was in the seventh grade. Wow. So, yeah, so I remember those times, and uh, and, and you, money can't buy that. So. I know you just have a bunch of stuff that you you did with all your nieces and nephews, and but you always said how Joseph was kind of like your shadow, your right hand, and uh, we couldn't let this day pass by. We had to give him an epic, on we had to honor him in an epic way today. So, yeah, so whatever you feel like talking about, Uncle Fred, it don't matter to me. I just I, I sent the link up, Roxanne. And I, I'm gonna put it in the chat because uh, that's your other that's your other daughter. <laughs> and uh because i like i say she roxanne just took to you so that, that and all of us did but um i know sometimes we get on your nerve asking 50 million questions but you got to look at, at us uh since you've known me i've lost both my parents uh and, and other people around here they've lost loved ones and 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 uh and unfortunately, some of the people that was over here supporting us, um, they passed on like legit doctors and other people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you like you like the uh, the uh, elder statesman over here. So whenever we we have an issue, 
it might be something small. Oh, you worried about that? But to us, you know, we I can't pick up my phone no more and say, Mom and Dad, I, what you think about this? I can't do that. So I run a lot of stuff by you because you've been where I'm trying to go in life. Mm. And I haven't gotten there yet, see? Uh, so good Lord, see fit to let me live a little, little while longer because you always laugh. I say, oh, I'm so tired or I'm sore. And you just laugh when all of us complain about our little aches and pains. You're like, okay, keep living, keep living. And we just laugh. And uh, you really see what aches and pains are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I, that's true. But um, I, if I make it to June, I'll be 55. Got the age I never thought I'd be around to see. So, because mm. uh, I couldn't even envision my life when I was in my 20s being this old. And now I look, I'm like, oh, 50 is not that old. You know, cause, but every day I look over my left and right. Somebody that I started out with, they're not here no more. So, right. yeah, hold on. Hey, Roxanne. Hey, can y'all hey, hear Hey, Roxanne. Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> so, we got Mr. Lips in the uh, chat. Okay. Oh, I called him. I talked to him. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Lips, oh my God. I cannot thank that man enough because he was down in Georgia. And when Joe was in the hospital, mm -hmm. that man was there just about every day. He stayed there for hours. In the last few days of Joe's life, let me tell you, Lips had his phone and he went live in that hospital with Joe for us mm -hmm. because we had already gone down to see Joe and we couldn't go back down again. And lips would stay there for literally hours. I mean, hours. That man stayed there. And he let us talk to Joe. Hmm. And I'm telling you, I can never thank that man. He was man an enough. angel. Um, he was no, an angel. Trust yeah. me, he was an angel. Yeah. He would go see Joe when we couldn't even talk to Joe. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lips. Yeah, so, thank Lips, you. I I will never forget you. Never. Thank you. You can believe that. Thank never. You. you in production, never forget you. Mm -hmm. they went and down Joe was more were, like a mm -hmm. son to Uncle Fred. It was, and, it, was, it was funny because some of my adopted sons, right, they would come around or I'd say something about them and i and I sometimes did this just to tease you. I said, oh, yeah, that's my son. You ain't got no son. That's your fake son. I'm your only real son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just, I have, I put that in the chat because when Daryl was saying, you know, you're like all of our uncles. I know he up there talking about he ain't y'all damn uncle. That's my uncle. Because <laughs> that's what he used to say to me. Yeah, we were going share. back and forth. That ain't your uncle, Roxanne. <laughs> yeah, you gotta share. Uh, <sighs> he didn't want to share his uncle. I don't know. He why. sure didn't. He did not. Oh yeah, well, I mean, from the time he was could walk, he was up under you. So I understand that, but it was thank no you, way. Lips. Thank you so it, much. God, yeah. thank you. It was just no way. Uh, we could just let this day go by. Um, I was I, I can't lie, I was I was dreading it a little because but I know he's in a better place. Just like my dad, if he'd still been alive this month on the 29th, he would have been 90. So mm. I, I I don't dwell on the how it ended, I dwell on the good time. The good times. Yeah, because we all gotta go that way that they've gone. So um and we, we don't know the, the moment or the hour when it's going to happen. But And my thing is this. If, if they know you're not getting well, mm -hmm. if they tell you it would have to be a supernatural miracle mm -hmm. for you to get up and be like you used to be, if that didn't happen, then I don't want somebody laying around suffering, just waiting. Me either. Me either. You know, I don't care how much I love you. I don't care how much it hurts. And with Joe, it hurt beyond hurt. I mean, when Joe left here, it hurt me beyond hurt. Yeah. Beyond hurt. And yeah. and I I was telling somebody the other day, I don't think I even felt feel it yet. 
But that's how hurt I am because it hurt but me beyond. Was, he was so at peace, though, Uncle Fred. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. I think that's what, I, I don't, I don't, I think you're just going to, it's going to be all right. It's going to be what it was because he was so at peace. Let me share a story with you that brings me to peace. That brings me peace that passes understanding because I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. It was, I think, the Saturday night before Joe passed. Mm -hmm. Joe was telling his sister and them the story. He said, God came to him mm. and took him back and showed him his life. He said God showed him all the good he did in his life. And Joe said, I never thought I did all that good. But when God was showing it to him, he knew he did it. And after God showed him that, he said it was in a dream. But to hear them tell it, I keep telling them, no, I don't believe it was a dream. I mm -hmm. literally believe it was a vision. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between a dream and a vision. And I really, in all my heart, believe Joe had a vision. Mm -hmm. And after they told me that story, and Joe was at peace after that. Joe was at peace after he had that vision. Mm -hmm. And that's what kept me calm. Mm -hmm. Because it was like, with me, it was like, okay, it is well. Mm -hmm. It is well. So I was at peace. And he said that he, he was ready to go see his mother, his grandmother, Uncle David, mommy. He was ready. He was ready. He wasn't fighting. He wasn't kicking. He wasn't screaming. He was ready. And he even told one of his friends, I'm dying. Mm. He even told one of his friends, I'm dying. Mm. So he knew what was getting ready to happen. We just didn't know when. Mm. Yeah, I remember. Uh, i never forget it. The last time I flew down, it was in January before my father passed. And I was sitting in the room. It was just me and him alone. Uh, now, yeah. just one second. Yeah. Uh-huh. Lips, amen to what you just said. Yeah. Amen to what you just said. I'm sorry, Daryl. Go ahead. No, that's no problem. And uh, he said, get whatever you want out of the closet because I don't need it no more. And I didn't, I was like, don't say that. He said, no. He said, my warranty is running out. Mm. He used to say that and it used to bother me. So I said, Dad, don't say that. He said, I'm okay with it. He said, everybody want to live a long time, but my warrant is running out and I'm okay. I did everything I, God brought me here to do. And I got everything that he said I could have. He said, no, get some more. I, I, I packed up everything. I said, I have to come and get some more when I drive down because I flew down that time. And the next time I saw him was in April. And I drove down and he had really taken a decline. And my mama said to him, you know who that is over there? Because I mean, he was real weak. And he would hardly talk, but when he saw me, he was like, he said, that's my baby boy. And I walked over and I kissed him on the head and he took his little hand, he rubbed my bald head. He said, you still cutting your hair off? And I said, yeah, dad, I'm bald. I can't walk around holding my top. And he just laughed and he was in the nursing home. So the next time I saw him was, they said, if you want to see him again, you better get here. So I, y'all know, you know, cause we was all talking. I said, hey, I'm about to get to the airport. And I went from the airport straight to the hospital because they didn't think he was going to make it. They didn't think I was going to make it in time. And I sat there with him. They said, take all the time you want. And he had moved or responded or done nothing in like two, three days. As soon as I came in there, I saw the monitor just beep, beep. Mm -hmm. And I said, your baby boy is here. And as soon as I said, his eyes start flickering. And I caught his hand. He kind of did my hand like that. They said he hadn't moved in two days. And mm -hmm. the monitor just started going. I said, it's okay. Go on and go. I said, I I'll take care of mama. We'll take care of him. And I think I got home maybe an hour or two after that. He was he had passed on. Yeah. But he, sometimes he, we he, have to let them, yeah, it was some, sometimes we have to let them know it's okay to go. Mm -hmm. And I did that with my uncle too. That I have tattooed on my arm. It was the strangest thing. That was the first time I actually saw somebody transition, take his last mm -hmm. breath. 
my uncle, uh, it was so odd because like the night before, he was just calling people's names and I wish I had wrote them down, but he was talking to people that it, and my family that had already passed on as if they were in the room with us. Okay. And I remember, and I was holding his hand that morning. I said, it's okay, go on and go. Cause he was struggling, fighting that day as breath. And, and then when he passed, the, the strangest thing I'd ever seen in my life, he smiled when he took his last breath and a tear came down his face on both sides. And he, wow. was, and he was gone. Wow. And it was the most peaceful thing I'd ever seen in my life. He smiled. It was like, it was like, it's over now. And he just, and that tear went down both sides of his face. He was gone. That's why I know when I saw him pass, when I saw my daddy, I knew, I said, if, if you didn't believe before, I know for a fact there's life after you transition because they went with peace. Mm -hmm. And my uncle used to always say, all I want is salvation. He said, because I can't take nothing with me. All I want is salvation and God's grace and mercy. And so that comforted me. Uh, when I dealt with both of them past and then when my mother passed, it, it kind of caught me off guard because my brother, I just talked to her the day before on, on the cam on my cell phone and he was feeding her and she just, she just missed my daddy. And then she just, once she said, I don't want nothing else to eat. And my brother said he turned and she just, and she went peacefully. She left here on her terms in her house, in her bed, mm. no suffering, none of that. And so, when when we have our loved ones like that, we we we're sad because we're still here, right? But they're not, right? And we we miss them. So that's what once we can get past that part, we'll never stop missing them. But what what we mess up, we get tired of it, how they were in the last days instead of looking at everything, all right. the good times we had with them, all the laughing and joke. Because some days I'd be driving, like today, I got real emotional thinking about them like man i miss my parents i miss my parents blah 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 but then i thought about it i said they wouldn't want me like that and whenever i get like that i stop i said no because if i truly love them i'll dwell on the good stuff mm -hmm. not say it and uh that gets me through uncle fred i don't know like you said that peace that just surpasses all understanding i just get calm because i'll start thinking about funny stuff or Everybody says I act just like my dad. I even look like him. I can't see it, but everybody else does. So sometimes when I'm dealing with my boys, I have to catch myself. I said, darn, did I really just say that I sound just like my old man? Because I used to think mm -hmm. he was so old-fashioned, but then I had kids of my own, and everything he was telling me, it makes sense now. It makes sense now. Yeah. It all makes sense, and I'm so glad I listened to him as I was. I was butting heads with him when I was younger, but as I got older and I had my own kids, I actually had to thank God. I told my, I got on my knees literally, and Mama was laughing. He was sitting in the recliner. I said, "Daddy," I said, I'm, "I apologize to you, man to man, not father to son, man to man, for all the problems I caused you." I said, "Because them jokers over there," and I pointed at my, I said, "I'm getting everything back that I gave you. I'm getting it three times as bad." And he just right. burst out laughing. And he he popped me on the on the back. He said, "Well, you're going to deal with it like I did," and, mm. and my mom just started laughing. So. I remember like you were sharing those memories with, about Joseph. I, that's what I, I think about whenever I feel myself getting sad. Uh, like here I'm sitting in the room now across from my dad's flag on the wall. And I, that's just a part of who he was. I don't, and you know, I, I wear this with, with his, my parents picture on, on my neck. I take them wherever I go. I refuse to let sadness overcome me. Just like when, when Joseph passed, I didn't want to bombard you because I knew what you were handling because you were trying to get his arrangements and his affairs in order. And I had to unfortunately do it twice in like 18 months time. Mm. So I just like I told you, I know the rest of us are like, Hey, if you need to talk, just call us. If not, or whatever you need, just let us know. But I just didn't want to get up in your face and it just, cause you had, you had family you were dealing with, you were, you were sad. So you had to kind of put your feelings to the side to make sure the business was handled. And that's a lot of stress, and people don't realize that. And uh, but some people are just really blessed that they still have their family, uh, they still have their children, and some people people haven't experienced that like we have. Yeah, having to lay a loved one to rest. But it, it and it's it's. I'm, I'm even while I'm sitting here talking, I'm thinking, 
I think the reason why it hurts beyond hurt mm -hmm. is because, okay, yeah, my mother, my grandmother, my father, mm -hmm. my oldest brother, my oldest sister, my next to the youngest brother and next to the youngest sister, they all passed. Mm -hmm. But they were like, I, I, we've known each other all our life. And to me, they were adults. Mm -hmm. But when somebody that you consider your child mm -hmm. leaves out of here before you, I mean, your it child. Hurts. It hurts. It, it, it hurts beyond hurt. Mm hmm and but when I think about it, I'm so glad that Joe lived his life mm -hmm. to the fullest in the way he wanted to live it. Mm -hmm. He didn't care what anybody else said. He lived his life to the fullest and and the way he wanted to live it. And sometimes we get caught in snags, but that happens. And and we can't get ourselves out for some reason. But mm -hmm. but I'm gonna tell you, Uncle Fred. This is my Joseph thing. Whenever we'd be on screen together, whether it's in a private chat or I was watching his show, he was watching mine. Joseph's facial expression, because he could have never went to no casino and played no no kind of no. poker. He'd have lost everything because he, whatever he was thinking, or he was feeling. You just, he didn't have to say nothing. You could just look at him and know what what was going on. Correct. And his facial expressions would have me cracking. Oh, and he'd be like, why are you laughing at me? I said, man, you funny. I said, you just don't realize how funny you are. You just be sitting there. I mean, you can tell he grew up around older people because as I've gotten older, I don't have no filter. And so he grew up around a lot of people that didn't have no filter. They said whatever they were thinking mm -hmm. and the chips fall where they may. And that came up in him. I could tell it. Because one day I just asked him, I said, you grew up around your grandmama and all your uncles and aunts, and ain't none of them bit their tongue for nothing. They said, nope. And he just looked right off, and he had that little white dog in his lap, and he's like, nope. I said, yeah, I could tell. And that, he would just crack me up, and I would just laugh. That was, that was the one thing that always made me laugh about Joseph. He, whatever he was thinking or feeling, all you had to do was look. He could, he could never, like, Joseph, you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. Something bothering you? Nope. And you know it was. And you know there was. Yes. Yeah. He could never play poker. He would lose all his money. Because, I mean, he, he whatever he was feeling, it was right there. Yeah. On and his I, face. On his face. And I would just laugh. I couldn't stop laughing. It was just hilarious. But uh, And he was so quiet, though. But whenever he said something, that was it. Yeah, that was it. That is 100% correct. And I, I, I said... And I asked him one day, I said, are you, I, I said, are you stubborn? He said, no. And then, uh, who, who was that? Uh, uh, I don't know if it was you or Roxanne. I said, I said, I believe you stubborn. He's no, I'm not. I'm just, I just say what I, I have to say and now I'm done with it. And then, oh, you bust out laughing. You didn't say nothing. And he just looked over the screen at you because he was all up on the screen. He just looked over at you. And he, he couldn't do it but laugh because he know you, you would bust him out real quick. Because uh, I didn't, I don't see him uh, biting his tongue for much of nothing. He didn't. I, I, hey. And and like you said, when he was finished with you, he was, he finished. was finished with you. Mm -hmm. That was it. I, I think some of that he got from me because I put up with you until I reached that point. Like I had some people back when I was living in Maryland, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, we shared the rent and whatnot. It was my place, but we shared the rent and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And they would, uh, oh, I'm leaving. I'm moving out. I'm going somewhere. Okay, no problem. Okay, I can carry the rent. That's why I have the place. You mm -hmm. just giving me your portion because you're not going to live here free. Mm -hmm. After a while, they come back. Some else, they go again. And mm -hmm. I think the third time they came back, I told them, you can leave here on your own as many times as you want and come back. As long as I open my door, you can come back in. I'm only going to tell you once to go. And if I tell you to go, don't come back because you're not getting in. And, and that's how I am. When I've had it, I've had it. Mm -hmm. I'm finished. 
Yeah. Even at work, when I was managing at work, when I had it, I had it. That was it. And Joe knew that. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you another thing I like about Joe. Joe thought he was slick. Because mm -hmm. in, in my room, in my room, Joe was living with me in my room. Mm -hmm. I leave stuff on my dress and stuff like that. Because who's nobody got no business coming in my room. And I know what I leave where. Mm -hmm. Joe, and sometimes Joe would be out of money and he knew I didn't care. And so he slipped in my room and he takes some money. And I come, Joe, how much money do you take from me? Huh? Huh? I said, Joe, you took money off my dresser because you disturbed something. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Okay, I so said, come in, let me show you. This was here. Now it's here. And I know that for a fact. He said, yeah. I said, I don't want the money back, but you just let me know. Was he a teenager? When yeah. Young. Young. It was funny, but Joe knew. Whatever he needed, I'd get him. Whatever so, he wanted, I'd get him. So when you were, before you moved away, from, you know, with work and everything, so for the most part, he was around you all the time, except for when he went to Atlanta. Except when he went to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and 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 what sad, saddens me about that is because mm -hmm. this last time he went to Atlanta, he had said he never wanted to go back. Hmm. Yeah, he said he never wanted to go back to Atlanta. Hmm. And when he said he was going back, I, I regret it now. But I should have told him, no, you're not going back because you said you don't want to go back. So you're not going back. You said you never wanted to go back. So why are you going back? No, you're not going back. But, you know, sometimes you got to let grown folks do what grown folks do. Right, right. You'll regret it later, but, mm -hmm. you know, you follow. Yeah, you just have to love them and hope that, you know, hope for the best. Everything goes well. Mm -hmm. Hope everything goes well. So Now I'm going to ask you something. Because y'all were so close in that. If it's too personal, I understand. Um, it's no secret Joseph was a gay man. Were you the first person he told? When he came out as gay, were, he, were you the first person he told? He confirmed it after I told him. Really? Mm hmm So you 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 basically, well, you, you raised told. it, so you knew. I knew. I knew. Mm-hmm. Daryl, you you when you have been around gay people in the service and in life and whatnot like that, it's no it's no secret. So mm -hmm. what you do is and you don't be boastful about it and you don't be nasty about it. Mm -hmm. You you talk to them and tell them in a calm, loving way, mm -hmm. so that they will feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. You see what oh, I'm saying? Open it up. And to you yeah, because then they'll open up to you. And they know, oh, he loves me, and I can tell him anything. Mm -hmm. So if he runs into problems or something like that, I can talk to him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I told him, come on. You can walk down the street and, and see some people. They'll tell you, I don't want to mention any names on your show, mm -hmm. but somebody we know. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me I describe it. I have on my small Vietnam cap. Mm-hmm. But somewhere, if I want, I can go buy a big hat, mm -hmm. like the mothers of the church wear. So I'm gonna leave it at that. But somebody is always telling us they're not gay. Right. They're not gay. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, if you're not gay, in my head, I'm saying, if you're not gay, the sun really never comes up. So what's that yellow ball in the sky? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> yeah, you got a pause, friend. So when you told when you told that to him before he could tell you, it must I have wanted like him to be, I wanted him to be comfortable with himself around right. his uncle. Period. Right. So it was like a I'm pretty sure it was like a weight had been lifted off him because he probably was trying to figure out a way to tell you. Yes. And when you jumped you, in and said, Hey, you dead. You could see in his face the weight lifted off him. And, and 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 I would tell anybody if you know somebody in your family and you know they're gay, 
then what you should do instead of them keep keep uh concealing it what they think is concealing it go to them and talk to them mm-hmm. talk to them and, and and sometimes you can talk to them so they feel so comfortable mm-hmm. they'll come out and tell you mm-hmm. well and 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 I've had people do things this way well what do you think about gay people and I tell them they're people mm-hmm. they're people Gay people are people. God made the gays. He made the straights. He made the lesbians. He he made. See, I was talking to somebody the other day, and we were talking about this thing about gay and stuff like that. And uh, some people say, "Well, the gays are going to hell. You know, God is going to send them all to hell." So I, you you listen to them. You see, you got to use wisdom sometimes. Mm-hmm. So I listen to them. And then, Daryl, I said, well, I need you to answer a question for me. Because God creates all of us, yes or no? That, yeah. Yes, God creates all of us. I said, so what are you going to do or what are you going to tell the homophonites? Mm. They're born with two sexes. Mm. Is God going to send them to hell because... I'm, I'm I'm facetiously saying this. I'm not blaming God because God made a mistake and didn't know what he wanted them to be. Mm. So he gave them both sexes, a man and a woman, all with the same sex. So what are you going to do? Send them to hell too? Right. Why? My, my personal thing is, I don't care what you do, how you do it. God looks and judge the heart. All right. And that brings me to what I want to say about Joseph. Compared to other people I've interacted with since I've been doing this online stuff, you can tell a person that was raised in love versus a person that was raised in survival mode. Say that again. You can tell the difference between a person that was brought up in love versus a person that was brought up surviving. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. Their, their approach to life is completely different. And see, you could tell Joseph loved people and people loved him. So mm-hmm. he lived his life with love versus you see somebody, all they know how to do is scam, hustle, scheme because they're trying to get by or get over and it shows in their actions. They don't know how to relax. They don't know how to just be, be their authentic selves. That's just what they do all the time. You, They are completely out of their element when you try to love on them because they don't know how to receive love because they've never been given love. They've never been given love. And they don't know how to give it back. Right. So it's like a wall with them. They can never be be comfortable around you. They can never be themselves. And also they resent you because you can. Because you can and because your family loves you and know what's right. going on. Right. So uh, I had to learn that the hard way because I wasn't brought up in survival mode. I was brought up in a loving environment. So I give what I want the people to give back to me. Right. But I have encountered people, male and female, my whole life, and you can tell that they all they know is the struggle. Mm-hmm. Everybody, I wasn't born rich. Now, don't get me wrong. I, was, I wasn't born rich, but all they know is the struggle. So when you try to take them out of the struggle, they don't know, they resist you because they don't mm-hmm. know how to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with because they don't understand why are you trying to look after me? Right. What What's your angle? What you trying to get from me? Thank you. Thank they you. always they they never let their guard down, and you can't live life tense all the time. You're gonna right. have a short, miserable life. And but, that's why I say with people like that, it's a very slow process. Mm-hmm. You, you can't just come in and and want them to change something. No. Mm-hmm. You got to slowly talk to them and and, uh-huh. and feel where they're coming from and how to deal with them. And right. at the same time, pray and ask God, how how do I deal with this person to catch uh-huh. them? Yeah, because you over here, you, you uh, like with me, I get on the phone with family, extended family, friends, and I might talk, all, like I talk to y'all all night, all times of night. But if I was the person that was in survival mode, I'd be like, hey, Darryl, how you doing? I- I'm all right. I'm all right. 
you know, I'd be looking at y'all funny, but I wasn't brought up in that survival right. mode. Right. So y'all know stuff about me that people that I grew up with uh, or don't even know. I mean, y'all y'all have laughed at me. I've laughed at y'all and because I'm comfortable, mm -hmm. because I was brought up in love. You know, I was brought up praying and trusting God and trying to help somebody. Right. With no ulterior motives. I don't just like, you know, you see some people, oh, I'm out here feeding the homeless. They got the camera. I want to take a picture because right, I have right. recognition. No, if I walk past you like a guy the other, other day, Sunday, he was like, uh, sir, I'm not trying to hustle you. I'm a veteran. And, and he had on a hat. I'm like, yeah, he, uh, he didn't look that old. But then I looked down at his arm and he had his the, the globe and the anchor from the Marine Corps on his mm -hmm. arm. And he said, I'm just trying to get you this homeless shelter. That's where the homeless shelter is. If it's on this side, I'm about to leave here in a minute where I'm at. I drop you off. He said, No, it's on the west side. He said, I'm just trying to get get uh get some bus fare. He said, I got seven dollars on my card, but I don't have enough to get the all week pass. I, so I just reached my pocket and gave him what I had. I said, you know, don't worry about it. He said, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I said, just be safe out here. But I'm I don't go out trying to just oh look at what I did. No, if you can help somebody, help them. If you can't yeah. try to find somebody else who can. Right, right, and, and that's how you. Should, if we take that attitude, treat other people how you want them to. How treat you them. want to be treated. That's yeah. one hundred percent correct. And that's it. Your whole life will be so much less stressful. You'll be happier, and the people around you will be happy because you're not going to be mean and nasty. If you just say, "Well, you know what? I don't want this person to hurt me," so guess what? I'm not going to hurt them. Right, and right. I, I can tell you another thing that where Joe got love from because. All his cousins, mm -hmm. they had an idea what was going on, mm -hmm. but they never showed nothing to Joe mm -hmm. but love. Right. That's all they ever showed him. They laughed, they joked, they played together, and never showed him anything but loved. Mm -hmm. And and that's what helps. That's what helps. We we gotta love people. Love. Covers a multitude of sin. Yeah, sure and even does. the Bible says, God said, with loving kindness, I have drawn me. I can't I can't draw somebody being hateful and mean. You sure can't. You push them away. You push them away. So it, because you're showing them two different things. You, you're, you're being mean to me, but you're trying to bring me to God? Or you're trying to, quote, unquote, show me love? It's like oil and water don't mix. Mm -hmm. So his family, the only thing Joe's family ever showed him was love. Mm -hmm. And, and, and he could come back and he tell you that. Yeah, I mean, it, it was obvious because when, when I got the word that he had passed, the first person I thought of was you. Cause I didn't know anybody else in the family other than you know you telling us stories. So right. The only thing I was like, "How's Uncle Fred gonna take this? How's he feeling?" And then I didn't want to ask you because I didn't want to upset you. But I knew that everybody loved him. Nobody had anything bad to say about him because right. the way he treated everybody. He got that love back. Mm -hmm. So it, I'm not sitting there trying to give him all these flowers now that he's not here, but right, right. that was just who he was. Who he was. From my perspective and my talking to him, my laughing, cracking jokes with him, he was just a nice guy. And I don't, you weren't on, on these calls though. And I, I say, Joe, and he said, yeah, Daryl. And he had already started laughing. I said, I would say it just like that. I said, I have a gay question there, uh, Joe. He said, oh, Lord. I said, no. I said, I said, I don't know unless I ask a gay person. I don't know. And he would answer all my questions, no matter how silly he thought it was. I said, just do me one favor, Joe. He said, what's that? I said, don't laugh at my face. Wait till we hang up. And then you can just laugh all you want. Because <laughs> he was like, because like I said, the look on his face, he'd be like, did he just really ask me that? I said, I don't know unless I ask. Right, right. And uh, like when he got married and or dating, I said, well, okay, I, I, it, it may seem silly to somebody who's gay, but to me, I said, okay, well, how do y'all decide who's going to be this role in the relationship versus this role? He said, 
what do you mean? I said, well, I don't know. I said, okay, like I'm dating somebody. That's the girl. I'm the guy. I said, well, right. the two men. I said, how do y'all decide what, what responsible? He said, just like anything else. He said, it's just two men. That's all it is. I said, oh. And then when I said that, man, he didn't make it off the phone that time. He just bust out like he just laid. <laughs> but and I was sitting there. I was like, well, I don't know unless I ask. Right. But see, that's the thing. Having those kind of discussions with him is how barriers get broken. Right. Right. I, I grew up in the country, way out in the country. You didn't, you might have thought somebody was gay. You might have heard somebody was gay, but to just live and breathe and, oh, that's a gay person right there. Because back when I came along, people hid that. They went to their grave not telling people they were gay. Right. And then I graduated college. And Lord have mercy. I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. The second largest gay population in the entire country and the largest black yeah. gay population. And I got here and I moved. I'm looking this way. I'm looking that way. And I told Joseph this story. I said, the first weekend I was there, I because my birthday is in June. And every June around my birthday, they would have the National Gay and Lesbian uh, weekend. weekend. Okay. I didn't know this. So I'm riding the train. I'm going downtown. I see all these people going to the park. I said, okay, this must be a concert or something. So I'm following the crowd. And I get to the edge of the park and I see this big banner that says, Atlanta welcomes the, the two, 1993 gay and lesbian such and such. I said, oh my God. I said, this is all I need. Somebody down here to see me. And they swear up and down. I'm gay too. And back in 93, I said, I wasn't homophobic, but it was just the idea. I was like, just imagine one of my college classmates see me, even though they'd have to be down there. Yeah, right, right, right. And I got home and I called my dad. My dad laughed at me so hard. And then when I told Joseph the story, how my dad laughed, at me, he was just hollering. He just, he just couldn't even stop laughing. I said, I didn't know. He said, how could you not know? I said, dude, I said, I just told you I grew up in the country and I just moved from the country to the big city. And the first little outing I'm, while, while I was there, <laughs> Why was at work? So I'm going, I'm just going trying to see the city. Right. So I hop on the train because I didn't want to drive in Atlanta. Traffic was bad. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I Marcellus, I'm gonna get you. Uh so I get down there to that park, and it must have been 200,000 people down there in that park. And all you could see from left to right was rainbows and men wearing ballerina tutus and all kind of these white people now, you know, some black, but because but and then every Labor Day weekend, that's when all the black, they had the black gay and lesbian oh, weekend. Okay. Okay. It was always Labor Day weekend in Atlanta. And I said, my oh, God, it's that many gay people in the United States. And, and the guy that was ho one of the host hotels, it was so funny. That's why I don't know how I never, I didn't run into uh, Joseph. So uh, my girlfriend at the time, we were, we were filmmakers in Atlanta. And they invite one of the people at the host hotel invited us to speak about filmmaking because they were having a symposium for LGBT filmmakers. But I'm like, okay. well, how we got invited, I don't know. But I, I do know the guy that was putting it on, he was friends with my girlfriend. And uh, we spoke. So I'm sitting there and they could tell I was a straight dude. And and it's bad when you're the only straight guy and they're they picking with you because they know you're nervous. And the guy walked up, he said, he said, first time, huh? I said, what you mean? So I'm looking at him. He's like, he's like, this is your first time coming to, to a, a LGBT event. I said, uh huh. He said, we don't bite. And then the other guy said, who told you that lie? And I was like, oh God, I just fell down in the seat. And they were just laughing at me because they were setting me up, right? right? So later on in life, when I moved to New York and I went to audition for this film, because all I saw was they were paying $15,000. I was like, ooh. Let me hurry up and go over and try to get this, this job. So I get to this place in, in Manhattan. The whole building is nothing but all LGBT filmmakers. And I didn't know that. I'm walking. I said, there is a lot of, okay, a lot of people here. Gay and lesbian. Okay, I'm from Atlanta. Big deal. By this time, I'm comfortable. Right. Like, you know, so the further up the steps I went, the more extreme. Because then you got, you know, the regular gay people on the first floor. But then when you went up to the top floor, that's when you get them wild wearing leather. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I get there. I'm reading the script. And I couldn't stop laughing because 
because of what was in the script, they said, sir, you didn't realize this was an LGBT uh, uh, film? I said, no. And when I tried to read the lines, I kept laughing. I, of course, I didn't get the job, but they, they, they were so busy laughing at me trying to stumble through these lines with, with a straight face, no pun intended. But it's just funny when you encounter things that you're not, that's out of your comfort zone, that's yeah, out of yeah. your exposure. Joseph allowed me to ask the questions that I couldn't ask nobody else. Okay. And he wasn't judgmental and he wasn't like, oh, why are you asking me that? You should know that. he, Whatever I asked him, he answered me. Because he as knew you were sincere. Yeah, as trivial as it may have been, I'm like, hey, man, I don't know. And I don't want to be ignorant and say the wrong things that will hurt or offend somebody. Is this so uh, politically correct? Is this the right thing to say? Is this the right terminology? I would just ask. Like, right. okay. And he's like, because one, two times he's like, Daryl, what you said on your show, that that's offensive to people in our community. I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And he pulled me to the side and he would tell me. Right. He didn't do it big and loud. And yeah. This. And I and, and my and whatever I was saying, it was never malicious. And because I've had people that been online and you've seen it that happened to be in his community. They would say, oh, you homophobic because they try to throw that at you. I'm like, no, right. I'm not homophobic. I just don't like you. It has nothing to do with What's you. The difference, hey, right. It has nothing to do gay, straight, undecided or whatever. I just don't like you as a person. I don't care because who you love and who you spend your life with. I don't pay your bills. Right. You don't pay mine. And I don't, right. I, don't, I don't have a cross that I've died on. I don't have a heaven or hell to put nobody in. And Joseph respected that in me. I'm like, dude, I can, who am I to judge you? I drink. I smoke cigars. I cuss. Who am I to judge anybody? Right. I got my own stuff to deal with. So people are people with me. And and I would joke and tell him all the time. I said, you know, some of the coolest and most outrageous parties I've ever been to in my life, gay people hold I said, y'all had the best food at y'all party. I don't know where y'all get this food from, but y'all had the best food and the best drinks. And he just laughed. He said, yeah, we do know how to throw a good party. I said, yeah, you do. I said, yeah. <laughs> I said you sure do. I said, Let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. Why is it I don't see the people in the chat? Because you're in the, uh, I brought you up on the show. And you can read some of the comments. Like if you click on that comment button to the right of you, uh -huh. you, should, you should be able to see the comment. Oh, yep. I'm sitting here saying, I know other people see the chat. Oh, everybody. Oh, it comes, it all's up now. See, that's what I was talking about. See, if Joseph was still here, Joseph would have been whispering off, off in the corner of that. Uncle, he, yes, he would. Uncle Fred, hit that button right there. Hit that button right there. Hit that button right there. So, because see, I wanted to ask you if he was here, I would say, Joe, come here, come here. And yep. I was like, why don't I see the chat? And he would have said, just click that. Yeah, or he'd have just reached over for you while we're and clicked it. And clicked it up. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. One thing Joe did for me that shocked me. Mm. When I turned 70, mm. we were having like a big, oh, what is that word I'm trying to look for? You know the word I'm, you know the word I'm looking for because you've heard it recently. They're going to have a big. Uh, oh, epic celebration. Epic, epic birthday party. We're going to have an epic 70th birthday party. And we did. Let me tell you. We did, because where I live, you know, it's a closed community mm -hmm. and we have a clubhouse so you can rent out the clubhouse. So I rented out the clubhouse and everything else, everything else, everybody else paid for. Mm -hmm. The only thing I did was rent out the clubhouse because I had to do it because it's me that lives here. I own the house. Joe shocked me. Joe said, Uncle Freddie. I'm taking you and I'm going to buy your whole outfit for your birthday. Mm. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're just saying that. I'll end up having to give you the money. He said, no, I'm going to buy you your whole outfit for your birthday. I can tell you the only thing Joe did not buy me was my T-shirt and my drawers. But from the hat to the suit, to the shirt, to the pants, to the socks, to the shoes, mm -hmm. to the cane he wanted me to have. Wait a minute, he Joe got you a cane? Everything. Did he get you the big hat with the feather? 
You no. know, I was waiting to say, but, you know, but <laughs> it, it, it wasn't a big brim hat, but I can put a feather in. I let me tell you, with that cane and a feather in that cap, you'd have thought I was a pimp. I'm telling you. And it, and it was a uh, it was a brown beige colored suit uh -huh. that went with my complexion. It was mm -hmm. a brown beige. So every when I tell you everything matched, if I had a feather in that cap, you'd have said, "Oh, here comes the pimp." I'm serious. But I said, "No, no feathers, no feathers, no feathers." So you know you to put one on you now. Yeah, you put a feather in the hat, and it'd been a long feather. If I said I wanted one, he would have got it. Mm -hmm. Anything I wanted that day, Joe would have got me. My nieces and nephews took care of everything for me on my 70th birthday. Food mm -hmm. and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, they treated their uncle right. Even my nieces and nephews came up from South Carolina and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. and, and Joe kind of like, you know, oh yeah. So there's a lot of times Joe didn't show you who he was because he didn't want to be used. But Joe was so really good and grateful at heart that it was like, I can't begin to tell you. Joe, Joe was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And Joe did many things for many people that people didn't even know. Mm-hmm. That's why and like I said, his cousins, they loved him. They loved uh was was uh Kyla, Jermaine, Valerie, his sister, all his cousins loved him. Mm -hmm. They didn't care, they loved him because they loved him. You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? They loved him, they didn't care what you did, they loved him and how he treated them, and he let nobody, nobody. Mess with his cousins because mm -hmm. you mess with his cousin. He had this six six foot three big man coming at you, mm -hmm. and his niece. Oh no, you better not even try to look at her wrong. I remember one. Um, he was showing me older pictures before when he was real big, like he said he was. And then I showed him. I, I said, "Shoot, you were still a tiny man." He said, "What?" I said. I said, let me show you a picture. And I put my picture up. And he said, oh, my God, you were big for real. I said, yeah, I was bigger than you. I was two of you. And he uh -huh. thought he was big. We were, I was 300 pounds. I said, well, I was 425. He said, no, you weren't. I showed him the picture. He's like, I said, yeah, we both did lost some weight. And I would always get on him about making sure his blood sugars was right. And right. Taking his medicine. I said, stop being hard here. I'm going to eat. I said, no, you need to eat now. I said, you, you don't let your blood sugar get out of whack. I said, eat and stay on the schedule. Get your sleep, drink enough water to keep yourself hydrated. Sometimes he listens, sometimes he wouldn't. You know, yeah. that's, you know he, was, he was stubborn now. He could be stubborn if he wanted to. But, but most of the time he would listen. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just say this, because I see somebody put something in the chat about their uncle and being on dialysis. Mm -hmm. I want to I tell the people, especially those that live in uh, Georgia, mm -hmm. and if you go to visit Georgia, what you have to do is you have to be careful of the water mm -hmm. because if you look it up, there's 1% of the population. You cannot drink the water straight out of the tap in Georgia. Mm -mm. It screws up your kidneys. And that's how Jojo got a kidney problem when he first went to Georgia. Mm. And when they, when they finally figured it out, it was too late. And they told him, you're, that one, you're, you're the 1% that should never drink the water in Atlanta. You should mm -hmm. always drink bottled water. Mm -hmm. So that's why I, that's a warning to people. If you go to Atlanta, just drink the bottled water. It's better to be safe than sorry. But you know what's so strange, <laughs> Uncle Fred? He was on dialysis. Before I moved to New York, I was a dialysis tech in Atlanta. Oh, but I used to work for Fresenius. And then I worked for DeVita Dialysis. I had both. I worked at both of those. I was a dialysis tech for a year. Mm. That was the most hardest working job I've ever had in my life. Because you're supposed to be assigned, each tech is supposed to be assigned four to five people. Every shift I was, I had eight to 10 people. I was working 12, 13, 14 hours a day. 
because the turnover rate was real high in that job and it was just so stressful um because i could look this way and turn around and one of my patients could die just like that be prepared that somebody could die at any moment and the last two weeks i was there that happened to me twice and i said no i i i turned in my resignation it was too much because it was just one little elderly lady she was my mama's size same size as my mom and everything and every time i would give that little lady her dialysis i would take her off the machine she would give me a peppermint and she said come here baby let me hug you you to help me live another day i said oh don't say that don't say that no baby you kept you kept me around here and she would always give me a little piece of peppermint sweet little old lady and that last time i turned around and i just you know taking on standing blood pressure and her eyes went back and she she was gone. I she worked was on. Gone. I worked on her for twenty minutes until the mm-hmm. EMT got there, but it wasn't that could be done. And when I went to the funeral, I took it harder than her family did. They had to take me out to church. That's why I knew I had wow. to find another job. It was too stressful because I got attached to her. Because I saw this lady three mm-hmm. times a week. Yeah, four hours each time. So I got wow. to know. Her. I got to know her family. I got to know all of them. So. They was like, it's going to be all right. She in a better place. But it, it just hurt me so because her and my mother were the same age. Mm. And then they both had to go three times a week, four hours a day. Yeah, it's based on your body weight. Like if you're right. a bigger person, uh, you might be in there for four and a half, five hours. But a smaller person is normally two and a half, three okay. hours, three and a half. And uh, my dad always said, if they ever had to put me on dialysis, I don't want it. I'm just going to die. And I said, no, dad, you're going to take this treatment. So he got on it. And he just like he just gave up because he didn't want that. So I mean, he he never got to the point where they put the fistula in his arm. He just had it, the catheter on his heart. Oh, so he, he never got down to that point because he just once he started, he just gave up. Wow. Yeah. So wow. I, I like you said, uh, <laughs> that water is something else in Georgia in Atlanta because I mean. The filtration there. I think it's all over the state. Of somebody just said it's. Uh, Fowler said it's all over the state. Mm-hmm. But it's real bad in Atlanta, and the reason being, the water source for Atlanta is the Chattahoochee River. Oh. And that river is murky and muddy, and, and they're not filtering it right. And, and I don't whatever. care what they do to it; that water gonna still be messed up. And uh, it just is. It, it just is. It's like, like I say, there are dialysis clinics all over Atlanta. That's a big problem. But see, in the South, period, it's going to be a lot of dialysis because of the foods. See, most people that end up on dialysis. One of five things: high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, um, hepatitis, HIV and AIDS, or, or chronic drug and alcohol use. Okay. One of those is going to get you on dialysis because your kidneys can't filter that stuff. And Southern people, we eat all that soul food, all that grease, all that fried right, food. Right. And, and then you pour that down, people drinking and partying on the weekend, drinking that corn liquor. and, and That Southern living catches up with you. Right? Yeah. It, it, it does. And uh, that's why I, I, every time when I'm tempted to drink a whole lot of sweet drinks, I'm like, no, nah, I better drink some water. Like right now, after I drank this, I'm gonna go in there and drink a whole bunch of water because I firsthand saw down. Yeah, you saw it firsthand. Yeah. yeah. And those, I'm here to tell you, if you've never had a loved one on it, or if you've gone to the dialysis clinic with them, you see the effect it has on them after they come out of those treatments. They're weak, they're lethargic, and uh, yeah. And sometimes, so- if the tech is not watching and does it correctly. Because mm-hmm. I remember many times Joe came home and he was screaming because he would get cramps because yeah. they took too much uh, water too much, off of him. They pulled too much fluid off. Yeah. And you'll yeah. also cramp up because depending on how fast that mistake, the, the speed of the uh, machine, if it's oh, going okay. too fast, your body, your body get ice cold. That's when them cramps come. I mean, oh. it's, a, it's a total body cramp all the way from here down. And you got checks on either side trying to massage it out and ain't nothing you can do you know when a cramp hits your leg just imagine it's all in your yeah, arm yeah. all up under here all around your stomach everything it's just total body cramp and uh yeah because people it's just like the the machine that uh, you got that big machine but the actual thing that purifies your blood is the size of this microphone 
your blood comes out of your body, goes through that little filter, and then back into you. And the pump speed is based on get calculated based on your height, your weight, okay. and all that stuff. And they just you sitting there, and they're like, okay, we got you set at. 295 most people i put on i put them on at 225 295 but really big people that, that that speed might go up higher and that's when the cramps happen and that's why you see a lot of people they go to dialysis they have gloves on they have a skull cap they got a blanket because they're trying to keep their body warm to avoid those cramps see yeah. joe joe knew his whatever his calculations were he knew them mm -hmm. and he would tell the people and when it? the people would not do his calculations and that's when he would get cramped up and whatnot. And yeah. then when he's finished, you tell him, I told you. Mm -hmm. I told you what they were. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they they know what, what works for them and what doesn't. They can tell you better than most yeah. people. Most people, because they've been doing it how long? For years. For years. So, so, yeah, so. Joe, Joe was on dialysis for like five years. Really? Five years. So when I first met Five him, he was already years. on it. He was already on dialysis. Oh, wow. Five years. If I remember correctly, he was on for five years. Hmm. So I, I think also when all this stuff happened, hmm. I think you 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 reach a point where you get tired. You do. You 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 get tired. Your body is just tired. Hmm. And again, if I'm not gonna get perfectly well like I was before. I'd rather not. Then why am I here? Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people get depression is one of the biggest things I saw when I worked in the Dallas. Yeah. Department. Depression. Because you're sitting there, you knowing that this machine that you is keeping up, you alive. Keeping you alive. And, and, and you're hoping that a donor kidney comes if you qualify for one. If you qualify. Some people can't get it because they have other issues. Other them. issues that yeah. disqualify them. Or some people just won't do right. I was a young lady. That girl was every bit of 25 or 26. Little video girl. But she lost her kidneys fell because she was a heavy drinker. Got a kidney, still wouldn't do right, kept drinking, and then that kidney rejected. So then she was back so on. That was a waste of kidney. Because that could, kidney could have went to somebody else. Uh-huh. And the last the month after I stopped working, she passed away. I'll never forget it. It was like, I'm like, I used to just look at it. I'm like, why did you do that to yourself? Well, I'm going to do what I want. Okay. Okay. So then they shouldn't have given you a kidney. They should have just let you do what you want. Yeah, but she was next up on the list. Now, when my cousin got his kidney, shoot, he, he don't do nothing. He's like, anything that he think will make that kidney reject, he's like, nope, I'm good. Right. He don't even cut his own grass. They tell you you're not supposed to be bouncing around. Doing, he don't ride a ride lawn or nothing. He's like, nope. I'm not going to do anything that's going to jeopardize me having to go back. He's grateful. Back. He's grateful. Yeah. Because yeah. he waited a good little minute before he got, because uh, he had, it was a history of high blood pressure in my family. And he had high blood pressure and didn't even know it. Oh. Because, you know, like they say, it's a silent killer. Yeah. Yeah. His kidneys, he just started swelling one day. And it was like, it was like, Glenn, you need to go to the uh, ER. And that's when they found out he had kidney failure. And by that time, they said he had like maybe. 15 20 percent function if that because wow. a lot of people don't realize when they put you on dialysis it's not a hundred it's never what your kidneys normally do at best you're gonna get 35 percent of what your normal oh kidney. okay it's gonna clean it like 35 percent they i mean no no it's gonna the machine's gonna clean you out but your kidneys if you're fortunate you're at 35 percent some people don't can't pass water at all so that machine oh okay them. that's why they had to pull so much fluid off some people have zero kidney function their kidneys just completely shut down some people have some kidney function and they can still somewhat go to the bathroom but not much a tinkle and, yeah that's it but those people are in better shape than the people that have no kidney function okay because they and that's why between treatments you're only allowed maximum 1.7 liters of fluid to be put into your body. So you're drinking water. Uh, if you just got to have soda, I would tell you drink ginger ale or, or, or Sprite, something like that, clear liquids. Oh, okay. Because that's why I'm telling people all the time, coffee or drinking colas is not good for your kidney because your kidneys can't process that dye and it puts a strain on your kidney. That's why as much as I, I love Coke, 
I, I'll leave them alone now. If I drink a soda, it's going to be ginger ale or I hate ginger ale, but I'll drink uh, seven up. But I try to stay away from uh, colas or drinks, period, soft drinks, period. Because um, after I, that, that, that job was just an out for me. I was like, hey, I got greasy foods. I love fried chicken, so. But I, I know the that. greasy food is for the uh, gallbladder. Yeah, gallbladder. I had to, yeah, my gallbladder had to be taken out ooh, years ago because. My brother did too. Yeah. Believe it or not, I had. Oh, I would gallstones would go through the ducts, and let me tell you, that is a pain you don't want to feel. And normally, for me, when I when one of those gallstones went through, it was two hours. I was doubled up on the floor for two hours My brother once said. the gallstone passed it was like nothing happened mm. so i finally went to the doctor and they found out what was wrong they mm. said no your it's not like we can do something and you'll be all right no your gallbladder has to come out mm. i said what they said it has to come out so i they set me up and i went to the doctor and they were doing this is going back to the 1980s and they they had come out with this new type of surgery, what they call lopic, lopiscopic surgery. Mm -hmm. In other words, before you had a scar from here to here because they were cutting you open to get the gallbladder. Now with the lopiscopic surgery, they go through your they go through your belly button mm -hmm. and they put like two holes on either side and they know how to go in and and, and, and get it out. Mm -hmm. My gallbladder, I'm not laughing. I, I am laughing. I ain't going to lie. I'm laughing because now I can laugh because it was so funny. Afterwards, the doctor told me we thought we were going to have to cut your belly button wider. That's mm. how big the gallstones were. Mm. He said I had two big marble-sized gallstones and 30 little gallstones. Hold, hold that. Hold that thought now. You I don't know how to put this to the camera. You kept them. I kept one. I told him anything that was in me that created that much problem, I want something to remember it by so it never happens again. And what I found out is the big stones, what happens is the little stones, they keep solidifying with each other and they create the big stone. Mm -hmm. And I had two big, you, you, did you play marbles when you were young? Yeah. I and you know how, what you call, you call the jumbo marble? Yeah. I had two jumbo sized marbles in me with 30 some other smaller stones because mm -hmm. the guy laid, the doctor laid it out and he cut it open and he laid it out on the tray when he took it out of me. Mm. I told him I want one of them because if, if that caused me that much problem, I want to, you know, if something causes you that much problem, keep it. Like if a snake bites you, cut the head off and keep it in front of you so he never bites you again. Mm -hmm. My brother was at, at his job. He was working in an earthen home, and he, he went into distress with his gallbladder. He drove to the hospital, which was in the next town to, out in the country. He drove 40 miles with that, with that pain, and he had a stick shift car. Wow. So I couldn't do it. He he had, he was in the middle of the night working the night shift, and he drove himself to the emergency room. They took him straight up to the ER. Yeah, he had he had four of those big marble size ones. See, yeah, he was in agony. We always just thought he had indigestion because he's always be grabbing his stomach right. There. That's what it feels like at first. Yeah, so, you, you know what it feels like at first. It feels like you have gas and you can't pass it. That's right. That's what it feels like, and it keeps backing up, backing up because what's happening is. The gall, the gallbladder is trying to let the gall out, but the stone is blocking the exit. So yep. it's building up. And uh, I never in my life want that pain again. Mm -hmm. That was the most excruciating pain that I can think of ever having. So y'all check your gallbladder, go to your doctor. I just had a test a last visit. year. Huh? I just had a test last year. They gave me a full ultrasound and MRI and everything because I thought I had yeah. one. It was oh, like, no, okay. you're fine. You fine. So with Joseph, 
I don't even know how I'm just laughing, just think about it. Was there your sister, his mom? When when she how old was he when she passed? She she passed in 2010. So oh. today I think he would have been 54. Mm-hmm. 53 or 54. So uh 53. He would have been 53. And so calculate it. I can't calculate that fast. Yeah, 2010. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That was so, hard on both of them. That was hard on both of them. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I remember talking to him after my mother passed, he was like, all you can do is one day at a time. That's all. That's and, all. And, and and a lot of people that have had their, lost their mother or lost their parent before, they would tell me the same thing. This is your new normal. You just have to, uh, just one day at a time. Some days you might not be able to make it through a day, just one hour at a time. And just keep going, keep going, keep going. And, uh, but he didn't, he didn't seem like he didn't let Thing. I I wish I could have been like that. He just didn't seem like he just, you know, if something made him mad, he dealt with it, he'd just be done with it. Yeah, he's finished with it, right. Yeah, I wish I had that that ability. Sometimes stuff lingers with me for a minute. And uh I, I just I always admired that about him. He was like, okay, it happened. Uh, I didn't like it. Okay, on to the next thing. And I wish I could could have done do that more. I'm getting there now. As I've gotten older, I've gotten more patient. Because, boy, I used to be a hothead when I was younger. Oh, my God. I guess when I lost all this weight, I couldn't be a hothead no more because somebody grabbed me and threw me across the room. (laughs) (laughs) I I, I, I used to be like that. But then after a while, I stopped to think, what, what is it accomplishing me? Right. You know, in other words, in the back of my head, you know, you're going to get even. You're going to get even. Mm-hmm. And then with some people, you get even. And, and I ask myself, what did that accomplish? Nothing. Nothing. It, it did not accomplish anything. So I just reached the point where, you know what, you have the discussion and then you let it go. Mm-hmm. Let it go. You have to. Or just choose not to deal with that person at all ever again in this life. Exactly. Well, see, that's the thing. Depending on who it is, right? It, it doesn't mean I don't love you. I just love you from a but distance. I love you from a distance. And mm-hmm. just because I love you doesn't mean I always have to have you up in my face or be in your face. Life is hey, not like that. No, sir, because I am not going to be bothered. Mm-mm, life is too short. Life is entirely too short to be getting mad. Look at Marcus. Look at what Marcella said. Keep the snake head. Keep the. He didn't. He ain't never heard it. Keep the snake head. My God. Uh, <laughs> Marcellus, when I was in the country and we would kill a snake sometime. Sometime we would. Put, I don't know why we did it. We just put it in a jar and put cover formaldehyde, covered in formaldehyde, and just have it in a big old one of those pickle pig feet jar. Okay. And, and we would set it. I had one in my room. I don't, don't ask me why. My mama used to get so mad. And when she found out, when she found out I was in there, she made me put it outside in the shed. But I had a, I had a rattlesnake that I killed, and I put it in the jar and uh, covered with formaldehyde because I just wanted to keep. It was fascinating to me. I mean, yeah. it was a big rattlesnake. It had to be about four <laughs> four feet long. Wow. And, well, that was because some of them get long as 10, 10 12 feet because if they live wow. a long time. But this rattler had hit about twelve rattles on them. They can have more than that. So, wow. uh. Suckle as big as my arm, and uh, I had him in that jar, just spiraled around that jar. And my cousin come by, he looked, and I wait till he was looking. I grabbed. Oh, him. you tell me this man church to these. I ain't messing with Marcel. See, he, he always cut me. Hey, watch this, watch this. Make sure to go to the doctor so you don't get hit with a case of dinkleberries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not messing with that boy. I'm not messing with him tonight. I am not messing with him tonight. Nobody. 
Oh. Uh, so, did Joseph like to cook? Oh, he when he was in, that's why I didn't have to cook. Mm -hmm. Joe would cook every day. Really? And I let him. I just said, well, we need this, Uncle Fred. We need this. We need that. Okay, I'll go get it. And Joe was a very good cook. The only thing I would have to tell Joe is sometimes there's certain dishes he mm -hmm. would have to make two of because Joe was heavy-handed with salt. Mm -hmm. And I would have to tell him, Joe, it's too salty for me. I can't eat it. So make mine separate. Mm -hmm. And I'll add my own salt. And he would do it. He would do it. He wouldn't get mad. He'd do it. He wasn't a baker, was he? I was the baker. Okay. I can bake now. I, I can bake. Hmm. Oh, Liv right. said Joseph made the best potato salad in the world. He could make some good potato salad. Yeah, he could. Yeah, he could. I I, I had to I had to uh give him that one. Because one day he was telling what he puts all in and how he does it. And, and he showed me a picture. In fact, uh He's still on my as one of my Facebook friends. I looked at some of the dishes he cooked because he would take pictures. And sure enough, that was one of the things he had right up there at the top. Joe the could top. cook anything. Joe could cook anything. The only thing Joe cooked that, well, if anybody cook it, I don't eat it, is uh, oxtail. You don't like oxtail? I, I, I can't tell you I don't like it. I never put it in my mouth. Oh, man. I, I'm, I'm going to be honest. I grew up in the country. Okay, Never so you had, probably had coon and everything. No, I ain't cool with that. <laughs> no, no. My daddy would eat that stuff, but I never liked pig feet. My daddy and my brother's oldest son, they they sit there paying a pig feet and just be eating at the table. I said, you'll never have to worry about me asking for any. But I never had oxtail at all. Never tried it, never had an interest in it. Until I moved to New York. And I had my first oxtail at a Dominican restaurant that was down the street at the end of my block. Because, you know, they, when you go to the Dominican restaurant, they got the right, everything is rice mm -hmm. and meat and oxtails. I said, let right. me try those oxtails. They had oxtails and gravy. They had even had some oxtails with barbecue sauce. And I said, no, I don't want that. I'll try the one with the gravy. I said, I had the, the red, the beans and rice and the oxtail with the gravy on. Man, that was the best thing I ever had, Uncle Fred, in my life. But well, see, what I tell people when they ask me, I do not tell them I don't like oxtail because I never tasted it. You see what I'm saying? So I may taste it one day mm -hmm. and like it. The fact is, for some reason, I just don't want to put oxtail in my mouth. Now, that may sound weird, but I just don't want to put oxtail in my mouth. You now, let me, tell, let, me, wait, let me tell you this quick story. While I was working, this young lady invited me over for dinner. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask me, is there anything you don't eat? And I tell you, I'm assuming you're not going to make that. So she said, is there anything you don't eat? I said, I do not eat oxtail. I won't even put it in my mouth. So I don't know if it tastes good or not. I don't put it in my mouth. I go to her house and I see you, you can look at oxtail and know what it is. It's not like it's, it's a, uh, well, anyway, I, I look at it and see how it is. Hmm. And I'm looking, I'm like... The meat's around it? Yeah. yeah. Right. Baby neck bone is what I used to call it when I was a kid. And I'm like, what is that meat? And she said, uh, oh, taste it. You'll like it. I said, no, I don't put anything in my mouth. I don't know what it is. No, taste it. You'll like it. Mm -hmm. I, I said, I told you. I don't know. What is it? She said, oxtail. I said, let me ask you a question. You asked me, was there any kind of meat I don't eat? And I specifically told you oxtail. So why would you invite me to your house for dinner for oxtail? Oh, I just wanted you to taste mine because you might like it. I never, I told her, I never told you I did not like oxtail. I said, I do not want to put it in my mouth. That's a difference. So I said, I want to thank you for making dinner for me, but bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, I did. I can't trust you. If I can't trust you with putting something in my mouth, I can't trust you. True. Think about it. True. 
because you don't know what they're fixing you. Thank you. I try to sneak it on, but <laughs> uh, oxtail. When I was growing up, I actually thought oxtail was really oxtail. I didn't know it was just a beef, a cow's tail. I thought it was an actual ox. I was like, I ain't that. And and when I got up here in New York City, I boy, this is good. But you know, I can't eat it now. You know why? A pack of oxtail run you about fifty, sixty dollars. Get out. The price is gone. You know, after COVID, everything went up. Oxtails went through the roof. I'm glad I never tasted it. <laughs> chicken alone, chicken wings. Oh, please. You know, but for real, mm -hmm. oxtail, it tastes just like stewed beef, but with a bone in the middle. That's it. No, it but is. see what I'm saying is it, it has nothing to do with the taste to me when it comes to oxtail. It has nothing to do with the taste. Don't ask me. It's psychological, but for some reason, I just don't want to put oxtail in my mouth. Now, I've eaten pig feet. I've eaten... Uh, huh? You eat pig feet? No, no, no. No, no, no. Only when my grandmother made them. My mother's mother, when she made them, I ate them. And I would eat chitlins. Only, oh, when, my, my only when my grandmother made them. Outside of that, I don't eat nobody. When she died, that was the end of chitlins for me. When I found out as a child what a chitlin was... <laughs> All right, I'm good. I'm good. I'm I slop good. them down when my grandmother make them. Please, I my slop mom, those things down. My mama fried them. First of all, she to clean them. She taking them, turn them inside out. She would take a whole day to prep them. I'm yes, like, thing yes. you got to do that for. I'm like, I don't want that. But then again, I'm not gonna knock nobody because hey, because again, Joseph would laugh at me because I eat deer meat. I said, oh, you city folks, y'all call it venison. I just call it what it was in the country, deer meat. But city people, y'all had to put a fancy name on. So y'all call it venison, and they charge you double what it's worth out, out in the country. I said, I go out my back door and just kill one and cook. You kill a deer? I said, yeah, I've shot a deer before. He looked at me like I was the most savage person he had ever seen in life. I said, what do you think? Somebody had to kill the deer for you to eat it and eat your venison. I said, you eat lamb, don't you? Yeah. I said, well, you I, and you know, I've even teased you about it. I said, and Marcellus, I said, y'all eat Jesus meat. I said, if you eat a lamb, I said. Yes, I do. I said, you eat the little baby lamb that's on the funeral home family. I sure I said, will. I said, y'all going to bust hell wide over eating Jesus meat. But I eat deer. Y'all like lamb. You know, everybody got, the, oh, y'all like, some of y'all like chitlins. I, I don't know. Oh, no. After my grandmother died, I wouldn't eat nobody else's chitlin. Because I knew she cleaned them. Because. Let me tell you, when somebody's cooking chitlins and, and boiling them to clean them, your whole house oh. is raunchy. It is, oh. oh, Lord, have mercy. And I knew for firsthand how clean my mother was with them, and it still stunk. I said, I'm good. And my dad would sit there and be sprinkling that hot sauce on eating them nasty things. Him and my sister. But me and my brother, we'd be out in the yard. That, that's one way he'd get both of us out the house. All mama had to do was start cooking them stanky chitlins for him. We was out the house the whole day. Daryl, hmm? Lynn said, you need to try to eat some precious Jesus meat. <laughs> See, that's, that's why Lynn is a special corner in hell waiting on Lynn. For saying that mean stuff. If you sit there and eat a little innocent lamb of God, you gonna it's a special corner in hell just for you with the devil throwing coals on the fire just for y'all. Mm -mm. I don't fool with that. I really don't. I, I couldn't get past it. But strangely enough, I like fried alligator. I'm a country yeah. boy. Fried alligator. Well, deer, if somebody killed it and gave it to me, yeah, I'll put that stuff on the grill in a minute. The best meat you'll have is very lean because all deers eat is grass and leaves and berries. They The meat is almost 95% lean. Wow. Mm -hmm. They have very little body fat. Like when you make deer sausage, you have to put pork inside of when you're making the sausage. So the fat from the pork is what you fry it with because oh. they don't have... Very little body fat. See, lamb has a lot of fat. Uh -huh. It has a lot of fat. I tried lamb once and didn't know, and I felt so bad about it. I never did again. I, what's those little wraps they have where they cut the slice it off the meat? You know, it's a big piece of Oh, meat. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, gyro. 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 And uh, I said, oh, this is kind of different. And, they, and my brother waited until I ate the last piece. He said, you know, you just ate some lamb. I said, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> 
That's what Jai roll is, lamb. I was sick. I felt so guilty about eating that lamb meat. But yeah, well, what uh, did you what did you think they uh what I did didn't you, know. No, I wait, 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 wait. What do you think the Jews did with the lamb after they sacrificed it? You know what? I thought they actually burned them on the altar. I didn't know that they actually ate the meat. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't know. I, I really didn't. So you learn something new every day because yeah. like when I moved to New York, it's strange. I was like, I had, I was in the heart of the most cultural block, probably in Newark. One end was a Brazilian steakhouse. The other end was a Dominican restaurant. In the middle of my block, it was a, a Puerto Rican like little stand with, the, with so I got all those food and then the block over was some African place and then the other place Haitian and Jamaican uh, in okay. the other direction. So I got all kinds of uh, international foods. I mean, it was just like wow, and I I, I could walk to everything, and uh, but I never. I always I learned real quick when I'm in New York. I always ask what you what you about to eat because you. Because stuff that they eat in their country, I don't eat over here. So I'm right. like, what are, what are you cooking? Like, I never had frog legs until I went to Coney Island. And you go right there to Nathan's, they sell them nasty frog legs. That was the greasiest thing I ever had in my life. But it tastes pretty good. And I grew up, it was a swamp in the back of my house. And I never ate no frog legs. Even when I go to New Orleans, I never ate frog legs. But when I went to New York City of all places, I had my first frog leg. On, in you, you, ever hear, you ever hear a bird nest soup? Nope. Bird nest soup is, I forgot what country it is, where the birds make their nests in the rocks of the cliffs. Mm -hmm. And the people, after the birds have their babies and whatnot, the people go up and they collect the bird's nest. And they come back down and they boil it. They strain it. And that's what they have is bird's nest soup. And they say it's good. I'll never find out. Now I don't know who the first person that tried it, but they say it's good. Mm. Mm. I'll never find it. Just like you say, you'll never find out about no. no uh, I will never know about oxtail. Yeah. I see Roxanne says she eat chitlins with Texas uh, paste pestle. Texas Pete, y'all can have it. You'll never if you if you leave me at your house and you could leave and come back, your chitlins will still be sitting there. It would. Angela said frog legs taste like chicken. Actually, it does. It's, it tastes like really greasy chicken. Mm. And Nathan's, they, they were selling out. They sold out of them that day I was out there. People were buying them thing, walking long, like a long chicken wing or a turkey wing, and they're just wow. eating them. And I tried, a, uh, the girl, I went to the uh, Coney Island when she said, yeah, you got to try this. I was like, and she's Jamaican. I was like, okay, I'll try it. And I bit it. I said, it ain't too bad. I said, but it ain't something I would order for myself. But I was like, of all the places I come to the largest city in the United States to eat some frog legs, all them frogs around me in the South, and I never even gave a thought of eating a frog leg. Joe would taste stuff, but not every, just any and everything. He tried something new, but not just any and everything. Oh, I got I, I to gotta mm -hmm. ask first, because I, I learned that quickly when I went mm -hmm. to New York. I'm like, hey, what's that? What's that? What's that? And because uh, you, because I'm like, you, you see people from all corners of the earth and they eat stuff that you don't eat over here. Have you ever seen these big cockroaches? Yeah. And I'm going to say it because it's going to turn your stomach. Literally, when they're alive, there are people that will eat them. Yeah, I believe it. People eat locusts. So I, and that would surprise me. Okay. Yeah, I, the first time I saw that was like, no, 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 no. I guess there's nothing in this world people don't eat. You're right. Because I've had fried rattlesnake before. It tastes good. It tastes like shrimp. Had it at the county fair, though. Fried rattlesnake. It was good. Alligator, rattlesnake. Shoot it. My dad used to have this saying, and, and it's true. He said, I said, oh, I'll never eat that. I'll never eat that. And like he said, Daryl, he looked at me. He said, look, boy, I grew up on a, on a farm. He said, if you eat a chicken, you'll eat anything. A chicken is the nastiest animal on the farm. That's what I heard. That's what I heard. Like, no, he said, no, a chicken will eat its own waste. 
And mm. then he would sit back in the chair. He said, how you think you get dark meat and white meat? I was like, oh my God, don't say that. He would just say that just to see what I was going to say. And he would just laugh at me and laugh at me. I said, I said, don't say that. And my mama wasn't no better. She said, yeah, that's how dark meat and white meat. I said, whatever. So mm. I went to school thinking that I asked my teacher. And she started laughing. Who told you that? I said, my dad and my mama. He said, she said, Daryl, they were just having fun at your expense. But he said, a chicken is the nastiest animal you'll eat. Wow. If you eat anything, if you can eat a chicken, you can eat anything. I said, okay, I'll take the word for it because I ain't trying to find out. Because a chicken wow. don't stand a chance around some black people. That's why they run so fast. <laughs> he said, my father cooked us some snake in it. Tastes it good. Yeah. Fried yeah, rice. I just read that. Yeah. Fried rice snake is real good. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't had any since I moved up north, though, because there ain't no route snakes up here. But when I go home this summer, I'm going to get me some. Mm -hmm. I have been, I used to hunt all the time as a kid, and I haven't been hunting in a long time. But yeah, Uncle Fred, I'm just glad we were able to reminisce in a good way about Joseph, because I know you had mentioned that you were dreading this day, and I didn't want you to be dreading it because he wouldn't want that. I know. He wouldn't want that and he wants you to be happy. We all do. We all want you to be happy. So I'm so glad that Roxanne called me earlier today and said let's do this because uh, we love you Uncle Fred. We don't want you say it. We don't want you say it at all. And for your family that's here, we, we're praying for y'all. We love y'all. And just know, we, we love Joseph too, because he was a he was he was a good guy. So, and just know this from somebody that's not in the family. I have in the time I knew Joseph, I had nobody say anything bad about Joseph. And if they uh -huh. did, they, they didn't matter. They definitely didn't matter. Because you knew better. I, I knew better from firsthand experience. And uh we were all lucky to have had the pleasure of knowing him. Y'all knew him your whole lives, but we had the pleasure of knowing him these last couple of years, and I'm glad I got the opportunity to know him. I'm glad y'all did, because because he used to have me cracking up. He was a great guy. He yep. he was a great guy. You know, there's just some things we wish we could have changed in life, but people have to live their own life. True. We all have to make our own mistake and we suffer the consequences of those mistakes. Look, look at this devil here. Hold on. Well, praise his holy name. Hello, gentlemen. <laughs> well, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What's up, Uncle Fred? Happy hallelujah. birthday, Joseph. That's right. Yeah. Rest on, rest on. I know that's right. I just had to call you guys because you know me, I'm a workaholic. But I just had to call you uh uncle fred because uh i know how much you love to hear greetings 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 and uh <laughs> so i just wanted to call you and give you the the official greeting greetings 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 <clears throat> now these people done told me in the chat uncle fred now i didn't know this so they told me that popeyes has a box now my budget don't call for the box today, but I'm going to go tomorrow and I'm going to get that box um, because apparently, you know, there's a there's a box at uh, at the Popeye's. So I'm going to have that tomorrow at the Popeye's. Uh, so I just thought I'd call and make that little old announcement. So One what's more in thing. The box? What's in the box? Huh? What's in the box? I don't know. I ain't never been. They told me that in the chat. I ain't never been to uh, Popeye's and got a, a got a box. So I got to go a, find out. A, a biscuit and two and two pieces of chicken. Oh, you don't get a side. If you oh. ask for it, you get a side. But it's gonna be extra. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. Do you all know how much a piece of chicken at Popeye's costs? It costs like thirty dollars a leg in California. <laughs> Good lord. Oh, yeah. But well, then it's time you move out of California. California. Oh my God! If I'm a, if I got to pay, if I got to pay extra for a side, oh Lord, I guess oh, I'm gonna yeah. be having just chicken and bread. You gonna, that's you it. Gonna that's what's in the box. Time. Yeah, that's what's in the box. But if you go to KFC, they give you the chicken, the bread, and you get one side. I think, and you get a drink. I'm not sure, but I think it's five dollars, and you get the whole shebang. And that's you get two problem. pieces of chicken. 
Yeah, you get two pieces of chicken, the bread, and one side and a drink. But it's about well out there. I'm sure that's about thirteen dollars here. That's seven <laughs> seven ninety nine. Yeah, I'm sure it's about seven ninety nine, six nine nine, seven nine nine. Yeah. Oh Lord, I well, haven't been a long time. Well, Daryl, since you was telling your story, I had to call y'all so I could tell y'all my 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 first encounter going to a uh an LGBTQ club. I think I might have told you this story, Daryl, but Uncle Fred probably never heard this story before. Mm -hmm. So, Uncle Fred. I was dating this girl. Her um uh, her sister is a Sony recording artist. Um, and uh so she's a she's a real recording artist. She has CDs and stuff that she you know put out and all this stuff. Okay. So one night they asked me, Uncle Fred. They said, "Well, you go to the to the gay club with us." And I said, "Well, I've never been to a gay club. First of all, y'all know because uh you know I'm strict holiness, and y'all know we don't do that. Praise God. It's giving honor. Y'all do Y'all do Say what now? You yeah, know what? 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 Say what? Y'all, y'all holding this in apostolic people don't do what? You know, we don't go to gay clubs. Oh, y'all just go in the house. No, well, I don't, know what you, I don't know what you're talking about. I rebuke that spirit in you right now. Praise God. Here come Mattia. You just lying like Mariah. Now hold on now. So so wait a minute. You know what I'm so, about, Alex. So wait a minute. So I decided to go. So I'm gonna tell you how nervous I was there. This is a real true story. I think I told you and Roxanne and them this story before. Uh -huh. So when I get to the gay club, you know, the way they had the club, because they did like karaoke stuff. Mm -hmm. So my date, I made the I made the agreement, Uncle Fred, that I had to be on the inside of the, the booth. Okay. So you had to put me on the inside because I didn't want to be on the outside because you know I was nervous and I didn't want to be on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> when you when, and I laugh at it now because in retrospect, how stupid and immature is that, right? right? So I climb into the booth and I get up my, you know, I'm on the side with the wall, but I got my arm around her because I felt like if I keep my arm around her, that would, you know, that would ward off any any issues. <laughs> so, so I'm in the booth, Uncle Fred, and all of a sudden, and see this how this how God will do you. Because if you're nervous or you got issues with something, God will always, you know, he'll trouble the water. So we sitting at our booth and all of a sudden, this dude who's singing the karaoke, he comes over to our table. He has on the furriest sweater I have ever seen in my entire life. Like, I didn't even know they made sweaters like this. This, I mean, it had so much. I don't even know how to describe it. It was feathers everywhere. Just he, just he likes them. Sasquatch. Sasquatch. Yeah, yeah, just feathers everywhere. That man took that microphone and he sang and he laid out on our table and he was singing, singing, singing. And I'm sitting here looking and I am just like I'm like a cow at a new gate. I am. My eyes is about this big. <laughs> I am nervous as nervous can be. Why I don't know, but it's just like okay. So we in there, hilarious, hilarious. Now what I learned in that experience though, they don't really bother you. You know they don't bother you. Go to the you go to that club, nobody bothers you. They were singing, they was doing their little thing, and it was just hilarious. So I had to call you to tell you my little story, and I'll tell you a quick story about Joseph. The first time I asked Joseph some questions regarding uh, some of the stuff that goes on in the in the in you know in that community, one thing I liked about Joseph is I could ask Joseph any question, and Joseph would answer my question, mm -hmm. and he and he would answer my question honestly, and he wouldn't judge me because I asked the question. That was a real thing that I loved about him. That you know he would he would uh he would answer my question so you know I mean it is what it is but Uncle Fred uh, I know how it is you know Daryl and I we're always praying for you because we know that you miss Joseph we know you do you know and we be trying to help you with uh, that technology stuff because you know we can't you know I tell you Uncle Fred you put something in the chat for Uncle Fred Uncle Fred gonna come back two days later and finally tell you he couldn't open it up and you be like you waited this long to tell us you couldn't see it. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times we've gotten that message. Well, what what is what does it say how to open it? <laughs> and we try not to laugh because it's stuff that you know that we don't know nothing about. Exactly. Exactly. 
And that's why you know Uncle Fred is tough. Uncle Fred, when you said when they take something out of your body, you're going to keep it with you. <laughs> As that right there, Uncle Fred, that let me know that you you are a you have been to war. I don't care. You might not have had to shoot and kill a whole lot of people, but you done been into some some serious heavy traffic and you done had to deal with some stuff in your life. Uncle Fred said you cut the head off the snake and keep it with you as a reminder. I say, my God from Zion. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. But I love you guys. You guys know I'm a workaholic. I gotta go back to work. Hello and what's up to all the people in the chat. Y'all behave yourselves. Um now Uncle Fred, I hear there's a little bird. Uh oh. There's a little bird that done told me that you know folks is trying to have a service of epic proportion. Oh, now I true. think Uncle Fred, <laughs> I think Uncle Fred. The service that we done had here today is probably going to be better than anything that they can put together. This right here looks like it's going to accomplish what it needs to do. We done said some wonderful things, and I appreciate you for coming online, Uncle Fred, and putting yourself out here because I know that's not easy, sir. But you know me. I stirs the pot. <laughs> you don't stir the pot. You stir it and you kick it over. You ain't never. Yeah. Look, and, and you tell that Lynn, you tell that evangelist Pearson, that she don't be in the chat uh, talking bad to the prophet because I am the man of God. And she don't be talking bad to the man of God in the chat. She just be disobedient. I don't know what's wrong. These evangelists today, Uncle Fred, they done got out of control. They out of control. To the man of God. They out of control. <laughs> God bless y'all. I appreciate you, Uncle Fred. But in real talk, we love you. We appreciate you, sir. And you know, we appreciate Joseph. You know, one of the things that I'm grateful for over here, we do have a lot of wisdom over here. That's another thing. You know, we got some wise folks over here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you can't tell us, you know, you got you got swelling on your Brian and, you know, you can't eat and stuff like that because we got nurses over here. We got people in the medical field that are telling us that you can't have, you know, pneumonia on your blood clot. You know, and they'll tell us stuff like that. And we figure that kind of stuff out. <laughs> we figure that kind of stuff out over here, praise God. So I'm just saying, will you guys enjoy yourselves? I'll talk to y'all later in the chat. Uh, we do need to get together because we got to we gotta make sure that uh, we, we protect some stuff over here. Uh, but I love y'all. Talk to y'all later. All right, man. Appreciate it. All right. All right. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. I done upset the apple cart. See, I came at the end right there, and I had to upset and turn the cart over so, you know, that way I can keep y'all going and keep y'all pushing. All I right. see y'all soon because God's right. got some great things coming. Y'all just don't know it. 2024, 2024 is going to be a great year. It's going to be a – I'm going to tell you, 2024, a lot of things now. See, this, this is why I'm getting into trouble. This is why I'm getting into trouble. Uncle Fred. There's a lot of people who has a lot of things in their life that have seemed like they are, they have diminished and that they've gone away. But 2024, even with all the stuff that's going on in the world, there's going to be some stuff in all of our lives that rises like a phoenix. Mm -hmm. It's going to pull itself up and it's going to surprise us. Some stuff that we thought that God wasn't going to do for us. He's going to do for you in 2024 and it's going to overtake you suddenly. You're not even going to, you not, you wasn't even thinking about something that's going to show up in your life in 2024. And you're going to be like, wow, that just came out of nowhere. Mark my words, 2024 will be a year of reveal. It will be and some of us who have prayed and asked God to stick things in our lives and take care of certain things in our lives. We're going to see God cover us like he's never covered us before. But he's going to reveal some other people, but he's going to cover the saints. Now, y'all mark my words. I'll see y'all later. God bless you. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, we've been, yeah. All right. We've been on here, Uncle Fred. I just I just wanted you to know, um, seriously, you know you can always call me. And I appreciate it. I yeah. do appreciate it. Uh, anytime. I mean, because. You did it for me two times. So, 
And any other time, you've never turned me away. So don't even worry about what the time on the clock say. If you want to talk, just call. I appreciate Seriously. it. Yeah, and that go no, for you. Yeah, that go for your family too. Now, yeah, he got my number uh, because you you can't do things like this by yourself. Sometimes it just takes somebody listening to you, not to solve your problem, just to let right. you talk just about. Just to it. listen. Just yeah. to listen. Right. But God gonna work it out. It's just you just right. need somebody else to come into agreement with you, because right. God gonna always work it out, no matter what it is. God gonna always work it out, and. Uh, I thank God uh, for you. Um, I thank God for having the opportunity to know Joseph. And I know he wouldn't want us sitting around sad and feeling sorry for ourselves because he not. And right. uh, like you said, he was at peace. Yeah, and that, he, that he was. And he went I out. I know he was at peace. And he went out on his own terms because he told you what he wanted to do before he, before he went down that last time. Yes, he did. He's yes, like, he did. Don't, don't put me in no hospice. He said, I want, I want, I want to stay right here. And y'all honored that for him. Y'all honored his wishes. Yeah. Okay. We talked to the doctors and we got it worked out and they honored it too. Yeah. So he he it was on his turn. Him and God worked it on out. And he went on to where he was going to be and get his rest. So with that said, Uncle Fred, you know, we'll talk later on tonight because I'm going to walk this little spoiled puppy of mine. Let me just say, if you don't mind, I, I, I appreciate the A team. I want to thank them for everything. Lips, um, uh, you again, you will never know how much you helped my family and what you meant to my family by helping Joe. You helped us. And you will never, ever understand how grateful we are for that. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to listen, everyone in the chat. I'm going to ask you to please, Daryl volunteered to have this live for me and to help celebrate Joe. And I'm going to ask each and every one of y'all, if y'all can bless his cash app, oh, wow. the invisible man, dollar sign, invisible man, or PayPal at DD Moore Sr., I would, see y'all got so many things <laughs> <laughs> but I would be grateful if y'all can help bless his cash apps because you see him up there, they're scrolling. I would be grateful if everybody could just help him. And I say thank you. Daryl, I really appreciate it. I appreciate the A-team. If Roxanne is still here, I mean, she's been a very great help for me. I mean, we all have our problems every now and then, but we all come back together in time. That's what life is about. That's what family is about. You boot each other in the tail sometime, and then you come back together, and you smile, you cry, and you keep on going because that's how we are. Okay, and, and I see you. It's look the one that had the picture with the uh, the food. Was that him? He does the uh, muff bang. Remember oh, when you put that up? That's lips. When you said something uh, about they did something to his fingers. Yeah, because somebody had photoshopped it some kind of way. I'm like, right. Okay. That's lips. Oh, so I have seen. Okay. No, you see yeah. That's got lips. A with, with, the, uh, with the name. Okay. He okay. does the muff bang just about every day. I got to talk because I. I never understood mukbang, but it's a big thing on social media. And people yes, make it a, is. A bunch yes, of it money is. Doing it. Yes, it is. I probably would have been a millionaire, but I dropped dead doing it because I was four hundred pounds. I would have had a double mukbang. But, but he does. He doesn't gain weight from it. I don't know how he doesn't. But I, 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 if you watch him once or twice, you'll say that man's got to be at least a thousand pounds. No, he's not. Hmm. And he eats everything that he puts out there. All kind. When I say everything, I mean all kind of different foods. They don't have the same thing all the time. They do different things. Mm -hmm. But that that's lips. Okay. All right. Well, it's ten o'clock, and I'm gonna okay. go with the puppy, and I will be hitting you up uh, in our group chat a little later, as soon as I walk the dog and come back in. This has really helped me, and and Daryl, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Anything I can do, Uncle Fred, you know we got you. I'm grateful.
All right. Okay. Well, well, good night, y'all, and thank you for coming. This was this was for Joseph, and uh, we we miss him, but we love him, and he, we know he's, he's in God a better place because we believe in God. We know He did too, so we know where He is, and that's all that matters. Yes. All right. All right, y'all. I'll catch up with y'all next time. Bye for now. Good night. How do I get out?